Olivia by Dorothy Stachy Introduction I have occupied this idle, empty winter with writing a story. It has been written to please myself without thoughts of my own vanity or modesty, with a regard for other people's feelings, without considering whether I shock or hurt the living, without scrubbing to speak of the death. The world I know is changing. I am not indifferent to the revolution that has caught it in its mighty skirt, to the enormity of the flood that is threatening to submerge us. But what could I do? In the welter of the surrounding storm, I have taken refuge for a moment in this little raft, constructed with the salvage of my memory. I have tried to steer it into that calm haven of art in which I am still believing. I have tried to avoid some of the rocks and sandbanks that got its engines. This account of what happened to me during a year that I spent at school in France seems to me to fall into the shape of a story, a short, simple one, with two or three characters and a very few episodes. It is informed with a single motive, tends to a single end, moves quickly and undeviatingly to a final catastrophe. Its truth has been filtered, transposed, and maybe superficially altered, as it inevitably the case with all the autobiographies. I have condensed into a few score of pages the history of a whole year when I was, if it's not at its fullest, at any rate, at its most poignant. A year when every vital experience was the first, or if you Freudian's object, the year when I first became conscious of myself, of love and pleasure, of death and pain, when every reaction to them was as unexpected, as amazing, as involuntary as the experience itself. I know the difficulties that surround such an enterprise. I know, for instance, how careful the adjustment must be before the necessary, dry skeleton of fact that can be clothed with the warm, round, living flesh of youth with colors and movement. I know, on the one hand, that the creature may become lean and hard, emotion withering from its bony structure, or, on the other, for one of that structure, it may lose its strength and purity and collapse into the amorphous delicacies of sentimentality. How should I hope to succeed in such an attempt? Why should I resist or desire to make it? Love has always been the chief business of my life, the only thing I have thought, no, felt, supremely worthwhile, and I don't pretend that this experience was not succeeded by others. But at that time I was innocent, with the innocence of ignorance. I didn't know what was happening to me, I didn't know what was happened to anybody, I was without consciousness that is to say, more utterly absorbed than was ever possible again. For after that first time, there was always part of me standing aside, comparing, analyzing, objecting. Is it real? Is it sincere? All the world of my predecessors was there before me, taking, as it were, the bread out of my mouth. Was it stabbed in my heart, this rapture really mine, or had I merely read about it? For every feeling, every vicissitude of my passion, there would spring into my mind a quotation from the poet. Shakespeare or Don or Hind had the exact phrase for it. Comforting, perhaps, but enraging too. Nothing ever seemed spontaneously my own. As the blood dripped from the wound, there was always part of me to watch with a smile and a sneer. Literature, mere literature, nothing to make a fuss about. But then I would add, but so Mercutio jested as he died, 
And they were not only the poets to poison the sources of emotion; they were the psychologist, the physiologist, the psychoanalyst, the Proust, and the Freud. It was deeply interesting. This withdrawal of oneself from the scene of action, this lying in ambush, waiting and watching for the prowling beast, the nocturnal vermin to come creeping out of the lairs, to recognize this one and that, to give it its name, to be acquainted of its habit. But what was left of oneself after this relinquishing of one's property? Wasn't one a mere field? Where these irresponsible animals carry on the antics at their own free will, irritation, disgust, cynicism, and scepticism are bred of such thoughts, the poisonous antidotes of the poison of passion. But the poison that works in a girl of sixteen, at any rate, in the romantic, sentimental girl I then was, has no such antidote. And no previous inoculation to mitigate the severity of the disease. Virgin soil, she takes it at the South Sea. Islanders took measles, a matter of life and death. How should I have known? Indeed, what was the matter with me? There was no instruction anywhere. The poets, it is true, for even when I frequented, the poets had a way to talking sometimes. Which seemed strangely to illuminate the situation, but this I thought must be an illusion of an accident. What could these grown men and women, with their mutual love affairs, had in common with a little girl like me? My case was so different, so unheard of. Really, no one had ever heard of such a thing, except as a joke. Yes, people used to make joking allusions to schoolgirl crushes. But I knew well enough that my crush was not a joke, and yet I have an uneasy feeling that if it's not a joke, it was something to be ashamed of, something to hide desperately. This, I suppose, was not so much a matter of reflection. I did not think my passion was reprehensible. I was far too ignorant for that, as of instinct, a deep-rooted instinct, which all my life. Have kept me from any form of unveiling, which have forbidden me many of the purest physical pleasures, and all literary expression. How can one bath without undressing, or write without lay, one bare soul? And now, after many years, the urgency of confession is upon me. Let me indulge it. Let me make my offering to the altar of absence. The eyes that should have been understood are now closed, and besides, it is not my soul, but that of a faraway little girl of sixteen. One more oblation to the gods, may they grant me not to have profaned a rare and beautiful memory. Chapter One, my reserve, recoil. From all the exhibitionism, was no doubt also a matter of heredity and upbringing. Which of us at home ever alluded to feelings or ever attempted to express them? But I don't doubt we have them as strong as other people. We were a Victorian household, and in spite of an utmost, almost militant agnosticism, attached. Without the smallest tinge of scepticism or hypocrisy to the ideals of the time, duty, work, abnegation, a stern repression of what was called self-indulgence, a horror and terror of lapsing from the current code. My father, who was a man of science and passed his time in investigating, with heroic patience and the strictest. Independence of judgment, one or two, the laws of nature, would have not dreamt for a moment of submitting the laws of ethics to the same scrutiny. My mother, from whom all her children inherited the ardent love for letters, and who read me aloud Tom Jones when I was fifteen, not that I understood one tenth of it, utterly unenlightened as I was to the physical sides of human nature. And who knew most of the Elizabethans more or less by heart, 
has the most singular faculty of keeping experience at bay. It was her abundant vitality, I think, that made her enjoy the blood and savagery of those outrageous authors. But she admired them from behind a wall of principle and morality, which kept her absolutely safe from coming to the any dangerous contact with their violence. And her own vitality, no doubt, never troubled her. Married at eighteen and the mother of thirteen children, she was, I imagine, completely unaware of her senses. For a person who was so plunged in literature, she was strangely devoid of psychology, of what any of us children were doing or thinking, and in cheeks of the most obvious and violent nature it might be, and indeed often were carried on under her very nose without her having the smallest suspicion of them. Her love for poetry was part no doubt of her sensibility to music. It was because of his style that she reluctantly forgave Milton of his abominable doctrines and learnt Paradise by heart. But I think her chief passion in life was public affairs, allied by birth and marriage to the aristocracy of Anglo-Indian families, the daughter and wife of great administrators, a profound interest in the craft of statesmanship, was inherited in her blood and fostered by all the circumstances of her life. I am trying to explain that though my home was very rich in intellectual influences of many sorts, there was in it a curious, an almost anomalous lack, an insufficient sense, that is, of humanity and art. With all her love of literature and music and painting, with all her vivid intelligence, my mother, I think, never felt them otherwise than with her mind. She was perhaps incapable of the mystical illumination. To speak of a lower plane, she surrounded herself with ugly objects. Her furniture, her pictures, her clothes were chosen, not without care or without taste. She was incapable of incriminating food or wine. Though we lived in a solid comfort which befitted our exact station in life, The sensual element was totally lacking from our upbringing. I remember becoming aware of this by comparing my mother with her only sister, our aunt E, who had none of my mother's mental capacity, but who was sensitive to art to the very fingertips of her beautiful hands, and successfully created about herself an atmosphere of art et beauté, luxe, calm et volupté. No, it was not only the unavoidable confusion and restriction imposed upon a family of ten children, which made our home so different. It was something much more fundamental than that. But those missing elements, which I think my childhood instinctively craved, for were not only to be given to me until a good deal later, until perhaps too late, when they. Assimilation was not possible without a profound upheaval and perhaps a permanent intoxication of my whole being. When I was about thirteen, my mother sent me to a boarding school which had a considerable reputation at the time and happened to be situated near to where we lived, in a London suburb which still preserved the charm of Georgian houses, spacious gardens. Spreading cedar trees and flowering bushes, this school was kept by an eminent lady becoming to the Wesleyan persuasion. Before sending me there, my mother honorably explained our atheistical views and asked Miss Stock to give her word not to attempt to convert me. She did so and conscientiously kept it, but I lived in a stifling atmosphere of it. I had the obsessive feelings of being an outcast, a plier. I feel the astonishment and reprobation of my three bedroom companions when I ironically got into bed without first kneeling down by my bedside and saying or pretending to say my prayers. 
I was liable during my first term or two to be asked about an elder girl in any turn of a garden path, whether I did not love Jesus, which embarrassed me horribly. I assisted at prayer, at Bible classes. I went to chapel twice a day on Sundays. I heard incessant talk about our Savior's blood, the dreadful necessity of saving one's soul, the frightful abysses into which one might fall at any moment if one didn't fly to hide themselves in the rock of ages. These people seemed to be set. On every side of temptations, they lived in continual terror of falling into sin. Sin, what is sin? Evidently, there loomed in a dark background a mysterious horror in which pure-minded girls must turn away their thoughts. But there was dangers enough near at hand which make it necessary to walk with extremely weariness, pitfalls. Which one could hardly avoid without the help of God. I have to do without that, but I was very wary and naturally conscientious. Even so, one never could tell. There was dreadful crime of acting a lie, so hard to discern, so easy to commit. If you say you had read a book and had not looked out the meaning of every word you did not understand. There you were. A special Bible class was convened. You were publicly told you were half mentally, morally, and spiritually dead, and your companions were asked to pray for you. This did not happen to me personally, but such episodes made me violently indignant and extremely nervous. I should have disliked. Being held up to public reprobation, I should have still more disliked being expelled, and I lived in a state of continual terror. The fact that after a year or two I found a friend did not diminish my terrors; on the contrary, but it helped me to endure them. We discover. How did we discover? After what innumerable feeler and cautious explorations of the ground, did we discover? What we both agnostics, Lucy, moreover, had the credit of having become one of her own initiative. Ah, oh, what a heavenly relief! There was someone who rebelled like oneself, who looked surely in secret too, who understood when someone said Prometheus was greater than Christ, and then still more boldly we ventured further. We talked of still more dangerous subjects. Of love, of marriage, should we love? Should we marry? Our heroes, our ideas, and that extraordinary, forbidden mystery that we sense is lying at the back of all grown-up minds. What was it? We knew dimly we should never understand anything till we understood that. But oh, how innocent, how ignorant we were, how undirected! How misdirected our curiosity! How far from discovering the right track, of even suspecting its existence. But even so, we knew that our conversations were extremely perilous, to be indulged in only the utmost precautions. We felt like two conspirators and trembled with terror if a mistress came upon us unexpectedly. Had she overheard it? Surely she had overheard it. We could see it in her face. Our conscience were loaded with guilt. If a special Bible class was convened, we went to it with knocking knees and frightful apprehensions. We escaped, however. The end of my time was reached without disaster, and when Miss Stock bade me goodbye, she said, looking over her spec- spectacles. With my benevolence that characterized her in the intervals of special Bible classes, I'm afraid, my dear, you haven't been very happy here. Can you tell me why? Is there anything you had have to complain of? No. Oh no, no. Chapter two. I was rather more than sixteen when my mother decided to take me away from Miss Stocks. And send me for my finishing to a school in France. 
There was one already chosen to hand, kept by two French ladies, whom my mother had met several years earlier, when she was staying in a hotel in Italy, and who had remained her friends ever since. Mademoiselle Julie T and Mademoiselle Caramel were dim figures flitting occasionally through my childhood, barely distinguishable from each other but invested in a kind of romance from the fact of their foreign nationality. They sometimes came to stay with us a little in holidays. They nearly always sent me a child's French book on New Year's Day, starting with Le Meilleur de Sophie. We progressed gradually through several volumes of Eichmann's Chassons, up to Le Petit Fadé and François de Champy with one lurid and delightful interruption to donors in the shape of a novel by Alphonse Daudet arranged for young people. Thanks to my mother and a French nursery maid, I knew French pretty well, that is, I understood it when spoken and could read it fluently, but time was too precious to be wasted on French books, so that's the only ones I read were my New Year's presents, and those only as a matter of duty and politeness. At Miss Stock's, the French lessons given by a deadly mademoiselle were a torture from which I took refuge at best I could in depths of agreeable abstraction, only coming to the surface of a moment when it was my turn to translate two or three lines of Lavar or of whatever the classic might be we were spending that particular term in stumbling through. The new school, Les Avons, it was called, was situated in one of the loveliest parts of a great forest and within early reach of Paris. It was delightful set off for the first time abroad. I travelled with a party of other girls, some new and some old, under the conduct of the two lady, Sidam, as it was the fashion to call them. I can't remember much the journey except the excitement of it. The school was a small one, consisting of not more than thirty girls, English, American and Belgian, and a staff of German, Italian, English and French mistresses a music mistress, and so forth. For the first time in my life, I was given a delightful little bedroom entirely to myself, and I remember it was in that room that I first looked at myself in the glass, a proceeding for which the strictest privacy is necessary, and for which, to tell the truth, I had never felt much inclination. I was beginning the new life, in a very different circumstances from the old. Here, I was not going to be a pariah, a goat outside the pale of salvation, and looked at suspicion and misgiving Wesleyan. She gathered safely inside it. On the contrary, I was starting. I felt, with the sympathy of authorities and the respect of my companions, the precious daughter of a highly revered friend, and if thought I, there is such a friendship between the French ladies and my mother, it must be that they know her views, and possibly share them. And who is that tiny little thing, like the brownie? I asked next morning, as I watched a curious little figure tripping and bustling down the long road passage. Oh, the signorina, the Italian mistress. She saw Mademoiselle Julie's side. And just think, said someone else, German mistress is a widow. Yes, she's all for Mademoiselle Cara. Curious words. I didn't pay much attention to them, taken up as I was for the first few days by all the novelty around me, by the kind of disorder that rhymed, by the chatter and laughter, by the foreign speech, by the absence of rules, by the extraordinary and delicious meal, by an atmosphere of gaiety and freedom which was like the breath of light to me. 
it was the term that begins in spring and ends in summer and I felt indeed as if I were coming to life with the rest of the world. The grief of a numbing winter was loosened, the frozen ground has thawed, the sun was shining, the air was soft, violets and primroses were pushing up their heads in the woods. The wood lay just on the other side of the road when we were out for our walks. As soon as we had crossed it, we were allowed to break out the fire and run about as we chose, pick flowers and play games. How beautiful the woods were, how different it was from the crocodile walks along the suburban villa-lined roads around Stockholm, where we were not allowed to forget for a single moment that we were young ladies but must walk in step and never fall out and not talk much, though talking was the only way of amusing oneself, for there was nothing about us that we cared to look at. On that first morning walk, my companions were a lively, pretty girl called Mimi. She took with her on a lead a big San Bernard dog who belonged to the school and whom she had special charge of. As soon as we got into the woods, she set him free, and the great creature rushed and bound and tried to knock us down, and we laughed and shouted, and were happy. But though I enjoyed my work, I was sorry to go in. The first week of the new school is a busy one, curriculum to be talked over, timetables to be arranged, names and face to be learned. Though a new girl, I at once took my place among elder pupils. I knew French better than a great many of them. I was to attend the visiting professor lectures and Mademoiselle Julie's literature lesson. Mademoiselle Cara, I discovered, gave no lessons. I was to begin Italians and go on with Germans and Latin. I was to be allowed to give up mathematics. So far, Mademoiselle Julie and Mademoiselle Cara remained, as far as I was concerned, to the Olympian height. I had very little to do with them and only distinguished one of the other by saying to myself that Mademoiselle Julie was the more lively and Mademoiselle Cara was the kinder. One evening, my friend Mimi, the girl with the dog, said to me, Mademoiselle Julie has gone to Paris and Mademoiselle Cara wants her to go and have coffee with her in her cabinet de travail. Go up now. I have something I must do, but I'll be there in a moment. I went upstairs, quaking a little, for I remembered the terrifying solemnity of my visit to Miss Stock's private sitting room. But this, I thought, would probably be different. I hope so. Mademoiselle Cara's cabinet de travail was on the first floor, almost next door to my own bathroom and just opposite to the ladies' apartment on the other side of the passage. I knocked at the door and was told to come in. Mademoiselle Cara was lying on a sofa, looking very pretty and invalidish. I thought Frau Riesener was bending over her, arranging a shawl over her feet. As I came in, I heard Mademoiselle Cara say, No, no, no one care how ill I am. And she turned to me with a smile. Ah, there's Olivia. Come in, dear child. Sit down beside me and tell me what news you have from your dear mamma. Her voice was low, sweet and caressing. Her manner, oh gentleness, oh sympathy. She and Mademoiselle Julie, having known me from my childhood, always said tu to me. I liked it. There was something I thought really lovely in that habit of the French language, which gives it an added grace, tenderness, nuance, sadly lacking in English, with a single use of you. Frau Riesener left the room almost at once, and when a minute or two Mimi appeared, we were soon employed in half a dozen little ways. One of us had to fetch the eau de cologne, the other soak in a handkerchief, and have the sufferer put in her forehead to relieve the migraine. One has to fan her a little. The other tucked up her shawl, which had slipped 
but she was so grateful for all of these little services that we enjoyed doing them and felt busy and happy. Then we had to serve coffee and look into a cupboard for a box of chocolates and then Mimi was to tell were told to show me the album of school photographs. It was the most recent ones that I enjoyed looking at most. For among those faces of old girls, there were some of the girls I could recognize as being still there. But it was an old girl's face that attracted me the most. It stood out among the others, not for its beauty, for it was almost plain, but for its expression. I'd never seen a face I thought so frank, so candid, so glad and so intelligent. But I couldn't analyze what charmed me so. Who is that? I asked. Oh, Laura, Laura, answered Mimi, and she said the name of the celebrated English statesman. Yes, his daughter, she left last term. After that, as the pages turned, it was her face I looked for in the group and exclaimed with pleasure as I found it. Laura, there's Laura. Do you admire her? asked Mademoiselle Cara. For my part, I think she's downright ugly. No elegance, no grace, always so dowdily dressed. But of course, she has inherited brains. Mademoiselle Cara herself figured in all the photographs, gracefully enough and languid, with a group of the smallest girls sitting at her feet. And Mademoiselle Julie? I asked. Why is she never here? Oh, she had been photographed. Is a mania. And so the evening came to an end. It has been unlike any experience I had ever had of school and slid away very presently, but had I been altogether to my ease, hadn't I left Mademoiselle Cara cabinet to travail with a curious little sensation of discomfort? As we walked away down the long passage together, Mimi put her arm in mine. Mademoiselle Cara didn't like Laura, she said. She was Mademoiselle Julie's favorite.